Good morning and welcome to West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Diane Alcorn and I am the Membership and Engagement Coordinator here. If this is your first time visiting with us, welcome. We're glad you took the time to join us here. If you'd like more information about our church and our worship community, please feel free and send me an email. In the meantime, again, welcome. We're so glad you took the time to join us. Welcome to West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church, a spiritual community whose hope is audacious and whose vision is for a more equitable and just world for all. My name is Reverend Anthony McCarr, Senior Minister of this wonderful community, and joining me this morning are Dave Blazer, Music Director, Megan Ross, Acting Director of Religious Education, Vicki Warden, Worship Associate, Larry Wise, Christine Solanti, and Michael Hockman, who are our wonderful tech folks, making this live stream possible. Together, we are pleased to invite you into this space, which is connecting people all across Cleveland and beyond to our welcoming community. Often, the world is not so welcoming, Often the world and its values are neither loving nor just. So may this worship hour be one in which we feel fed by a wisdom and a passion that remind us that life does not have to be that way, that there exists a larger love in every human heart, urging us on to what is better, let this larger love stir in our midst today, and may we be changed by it. A special welcome to you if you are a newcomer to our community. Gay or straight, cisgender or transgender, black, brown or white, you're welcome. Our West Shore regulars would love to greet you and will do so if you indicate on the Facebook chat function that you are new or relatively new. If you happen to have any questions and would like to chat with a live person, West Shore's member and engagement coordinator, Diane Alcorn, would love to reach out. Diane's email address is being added to your Facebook chat as we speak. I have two announcements for you this morning. One is a very special live stream Samhain service on October 31st at 8 o'clock in the evening, led by worship associate and seminarian Melinda McGuckin. For people on the spiritual path of paganism, Samhain is an important religious observance. It is the time of year when it is said the veil between the worlds is very thin. This is a sacred day to celebrate, embrace, and receive guidance from our ancestors in the world beyond. Through music, meditation, ritual, and mantras, says Melinda, we will invite the presence of our ancestors in love and in light. This can be a deeply cathartic and healing experience. Come prepared for your heart, mind, and spirit to be touched by the love that comes from your ancestors beyond the veil, October 31st at 8 p.m. via 
live stream. And as for my second announcement, Saturday, November 14th, an annual favorite at West Shore, our service auction, one of the best times of the year when we are enjoying friendship and community, we are laughing, we're having a blast, and we're raising money that allows West Shore to accomplish great things in our world. Today is the deadline for donating items and services to the auction, as well as to purchase early bird tickets. Your weekly e-news blast has all the info about that, together with our website. The one thing I want to be sure to mention to you this morning is the 50-50 raffle tickets that are being sold also. Just this morning, I bought 30 of them. The more tickets we buy, the bigger the prize. Get your raffle tickets. Let's just have fun. Let's have fun. And now Megan has a couple of announcements for you this morning. Megan. Good morning. I have just a few things to bring to your attention today. After church, we will have two opportunities for you to engage with the West Shore community. The first is our Path to Membership class, which is open to any visitors or friends who would like to learn more about West Shore. The class is led by Diane Alcorn, and Reverend Anthony will make an appearance. The second opportunity is a World Cafe to discuss the past, present, and future of justice work at West Shore. The World Cafe will be offered at 11.30 and 3.30. There will not be regular coffee hour today. Our first trunk or treat is this coming Friday from 5 to 7, so please check your email for details. This is also a reminder that you still have time to sign up for Holiday Pen Pals. This is open to adults and children. The sign-up link is being added to the chat right now, or just contact me. And lastly, our traveling chalice has come back to church from its first visit away, and it's looking for a home to visit. So please use the link in the chat, or contact me if you would like to sign up for your turn to host the traveling chalice. Thank you. Thank you all sorts of fun opportunities for people of all ages to engage. Thank you. Once again, welcome to this new day. You know, every week when we light our chalice as a symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, we are reminded that no matter what has happened in the week leading up to this moment, no matter how many jarring events might have happened, the gathered community that is West Shore Unitarian Universalist Church is a source of stability. It is a source of meaning that we all can depend on. In that spirit, we now say our chalice lighting words, which come to us from the great soul, Maya Angelou. This is our chalice. In many separate rooms, we light one flame flame of passion, flame of compassion, flame of humor, flame of style. We do not accept merely surviving. Let our mission be to thrive. Together in spirit, we are one. Let us now witness to the unity of our spirit by saying together our unison affirmation words. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia y el servicio su ley. Este es nuestro magnífico convenio, vivir juntos en paz 
buscar la verdad en el amor y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. And so may it be. And now we turn to our time of greeting. We greet each other in the midst of our joys and struggles in times that are heavily laden with all sorts of worries and anxieties. The world is in crisis. And I want you to know what the research has to say about people in crisis, how they basically go through four stages. The first is the initial heroic response stage. The second stage is the stage of feeling good about our heroic response. And then there's a third stage, a stage of disillusionment, one where we're feeling constantly irritated or in despair or angry. And then finally, the fourth stage, which is fatigue which is one in which our body simply cannot tolerate the stress anymore and the result is crash or burnout. Most people, I am told, are in stage four right now. So for today's greeting time, we're going to do something a little bit different. I want you to come with me on a guided visualization journey to a place where you might find a bit of safety and security something to help heal the fatigue that we're all feeling right now. Everyone needs a safety zone, a place where you can experience a temporary retreat when you are overwhelmed, or worried, or stuck. A place where you can always feel positive and relaxed. To find your special retreat place for today, I invite you to settle back and exhale deeply a few times. Hmm. Just let your breath come in and whoosh right out. Hmm. Nice big cleansing breaths. Hmm. And when you're beginning to feel relaxed, I invite you, if you wish, to close your eyes, just to be in this space of relaxation. Just let the music of your breathing soothe and settle you while we pause for just a moment. helps you feel safe and relaxed. Take a moment now to recall places from your past that gave you a sense of security and strength. Perhaps you remember a vacation spot that did that for you. Perhaps you remember the home of a relative or a friend. Envision now a tranquil place that felt comfortable to you. And as you recall this place, become aware of all the details that gave you a sense of safety and serenity. Bring those details to mind now. Now add to this a memory of another favorite childhood haven. This time, recall a smaller, special space of your own. It may be a treehouse, a hideout, a playroom, perhaps even a private booth at the corner store. Take sufficient time to recreate all of the sensations, smells, 
noises, shapes, colors, textures, all of the things allowing you to relive those special memories. These were real places and having now re-experienced them, your feelings about them, you're ready to create your own ideal place of retreat. Perhaps you can take from the childhood memories you just had. Perhaps you may add other features. Let your imagination lead you. Let a picture of your retreat place form in your mind. And remember, once you create your retreat place, you have total control over it. Nothing will happen here without your permission. You are free to tear up old floors, open the place to the weather and the wind, if you like, make things grow in whatever way you choose. The only limitations are your own self-imposed Boundaries. Take some time now to create that retreat place of safety for you. And be in it. Feel what it feels like. In this meditative journey that we take today, it is only a beginning. My hope for you is that after the worship service, you can go back to this space and continue the work of building your safety zone, your retreat place. You can return to it at any time. But now it is time to return here to the service Remember to bring back with you any and all pleasurable feelings to this space. Now, staying relaxed and content, slowly tune into your breathing. Hear the rhythmic flow of your breathing. Be in that flow as now we become ready to awake and open our eyes, if yours are closed, bringing back the peace and power of your sanctuary to this sanctuary, our West Shore sanctuary. And now awaken. Thank you for giving yourself to that. And now, we turn to a moment of lifting up names and news that people have asked to be shared. Among the West Shore family, we have some birthdays to lift up. Kathy Woodbridge, this past Tuesday. Howard Moore, too. Marilyn Spetik, this Friday. And this Friday for John Serafini, also. Happy birthday. The flowers for this Sunday were given by Gary Custis, Debbie Gatton, and their daughter Emily to celebrate becoming a family 10 years ago today and to thank the West Shore community for all the love and support.
throughout the years. That's great. And another item of good news comes from our own Kathy Strausser. Her grandson has arrived. Fletcher Field White was born at 2.30 this morning, 7 pounds, 14 ounces, 20 inches long. Everyone is healthy and happy. We're so happy for you, Kathy, and your family. Congratulations. Let each of us now say the names of people whom we are holding in our personal thoughts and prayers this morning, people in the West Shore community and people beyond, wherever you happen to may be, say into the space of your room these names. You may even type the name into our West Shore Facebook chat if you like. I'll pause for a moment as we do this. This has been our greeting time when we are called out of the 24-7 ordinary world into a time of peace and nurturance. We come close to each other in spirit even though we need to stay physically apart just for now, not forever, just for a little while longer. In a socially distanced time like ours, how healing to be able to feel the oneness of everything. And that is our hymn right now, The Oneness of Everything. Good morning. I'm Vicki Warden, 
the worship associate for this morning's service. Our sermon title this morning is Infinity. I don't think I quite realized when I raised my hand to offer to do this service to be today's worship associate that that was going to be the topic. But you know, if I did, I probably did so in August. October was a long way away and I'd worry about it then. Well, here I am. My problem is that I don't really grasp the concept of infinity. Oh, I know, I know the universe is infinite, right? That means there's no ending point to the universe. And then there are mathematical numbers that are, quote, infinite. I don't understand that either. I can't conceive of anything that doesn't have an edge. Lakes and rivers have edges. Physical objects have edges. Even history has edges because eras wax and wane. People have edges too, such as in you crossed the line, the ultimate threat. If I follow a highway long enough, it will come to an end. And you know, if you push me hard enough, I will probably say or do something that I shouldn't. Edges are everywhere. They keep our society guardrails alive and active. So can anything really be indefinite with no edges? At least on some level that I can understand. But then you know what, when I'm realizing that Sunday, October 25th is really getting closer and closer, I start to focus my thinking. So here's where I am. Maybe corny and probably obvious that love can be infinite, unending, no edges. My patience can have an end, my understanding can have an end, and my sympathy can definitely be worn down and out. When my family member once again commits self-destructive acts, am I done with him? My patience is gone, my understanding is at the very, very end, and my sympathy is pretty well shot too. But love, no, nah. no, nah, that's still there. Last week, I was discussing my reluctance to begin writing about infinity with my granddaughter. And her first reaction was, hope is infinite. I think she has a point. I may want to give up on something or someone and fully intend to do that, such as I'm totally done with him, but not really. I will always hold out that sliver of hope, no matter what craziness happens. And what about human potential? Is that possibly infinite? Like when that same family member does something so above and beyond the expected that I'm amazed. It may just be a specific deed that comes out of the blue. Nothing earth shaking, maybe to others. But wow, out of the day to day character that I've come to expect. That's when we say something like, you know, he has good values or the basics are all there. In other words, he has all the human potential that he needs. Maybe human potential is infinite. I like things and actually people to have boundaries. I like to know what to expect. Those qualities are really not very good for people on the creative side of the universe. I'm obviously not on that side. I am way over on the pragmatic side where I will organize your life for you if you will just let me. I will have the world figured out in no time, just ask me. If I get up to an edge, I change direction and I go somewhere else that's more productive. But am I using my own human potential? Do I suppose that, like my love and my hope, that human potential can be infinite? I am so tired of that cliche to quote, think outside the box, unquote. But it became a cliche because it's so apt for so much of our thinking, especially mine. I'm embarrassed to say I don't really like poetry. And I was an English major because it's too free flowing for me. Sonnets are good though. I like them. Every sonnet has 14 lines in iambic pentameter. Free verse? I, I don't get it. But really, how hard have I tried? I think I know the answer. If infinity is never ending and available to me, 
that I need to do a little soul searching of my own. I need to look past my concern for edges and see beyond. You know, I think this has happened a few times in my life when I had this outrageous feeling that all was right with the world and that I could do anything. I can't remember the specific times or circumstances when this happened, how many times, how often, or where I was, but I will never forget that feeling. Wow. I think maybe that's what euphoria is. Or maybe that was infinity. Thank you, Vicki. You know, earlier I mentioned the four stages of crisis response. And I also said that most of us may very well be in stage four right now, the stage of fatigue. The fatigue comes with low energy, feelings of helplessness, and you're just burned out. But I want you to know that your West Shore community is carrying on. We are not just surviving, but we are thriving. The pandemic time will end, and we are staying strong to see it through. We are having to think outside the box constantly. And the most recent example of this is about our connection fair last Sunday. It was the very first one that we offered, have offered in virtual mode. The theme was discover, connect, get inspired. The goal was to connect people with active groups that are open to members and friends of the congregation. A total of 14 breakout rooms or tables were formed with 18 active committees and groups participating. A total of 20 people representing these groups served as table hosts and had the opportunity to engage with guests and offer information about their group, and the work that they're doing, all the, way, all the things that are happening even during the building being closed. These groups offer a variety of ways for personal and spiritual growth to engage in social action work, and to serve on church committees such as membership, art slash aesthetics, and religious education. I'm happy to say that 15 church members and guests came to the fair, visited the different rooms. Of those attending, six or, no, six or so were completely new members, and they seemed so happy with this opportunity to connect. A program guide was emailed to all church members prior to the event. It listed the guidelines for participation, as well as information on all the groups and committees taking part. Thank you to everyone who, who helped make this event possible. And I want to especially thank Megan Ross, Diane Alcorn, and Dorothy Richards, who were the staff most directly responsible for this event. I wish you could be on the front lines like me and, and, and to see what it is like when these three get together and they are brainstorming and they're planning for different church events. It is a beautiful sight to behold. West Shore, thank you for your financial generosity for keeping on supporting this community that is keeping on keeping on. We need this place. We need it to stay strong. Now, please consider texting a one-time gift to West Shore. Instructions for how to do that can be found on your screen. Our offertory today is Beethoven's Immortal Ode to Joy, played on organ by the inimitable Dave. Blazer.
And now a poem by Pablo Neruda entitled, Keeping Quiet. Now we will count to 12 and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for a second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would not look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now, I will count up to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go. One of my personal passions, which you may or may not know about, is yoga. The journey of any given yoga class from beginning to end is first of all unrolling my 68 inches long and 24 inches wide mat on the floor and getting on it. And this will become the center of my universe for an hour during that hour, living becomes a flow of steady breathing in and out, in and out, while entering into a pose, then leaving it, then moving into another pose, and so on, which to me has always resembled what ordinary life is like, with its own sort of poses and all its comings and goings. Sometimes I am even lost to myself, and the flow becomes all, and finite and infinite become one. But sometimes the reverse can happen, and I find something I'd rather not, and I feel even more stuck inside the finite, as usual. It can look like this. I'm on my mat, and I'm in one of those pretzel-looking yoga poses. Surrounding me are all these other people, each on their own 68 inches long and 24 inches wide mats, in the same pretzel-looking pose as me. But maybe their pose is not as good as mine. See, that's where my mind goes. I'm judging the other yogis around me. 
I'm comparing, and, I'm, and as I do this, I am invoking rather pretentiously the Sanskrit names of the poses as I do this, as in my adho, mukha, shavasana is so more fully expressed than theirs. My rikshashasana is so much more stable. I can do sheer shashana and they can't. And so on. The judgmental inner voice comes and I feel an accompanying tension and clench of muscles. My breathing gets shallower and swiftly following all of this is shame. It's more of the inner judgmental voice. But this time I am the target, as in, what is wrong with you? Who do you think you are? Look at that yogi over there. She can do adho, mukha, virkshasana, and you cannot. So much for you, Mr. Senior Minister Yoga Man. And so on. The judgmental dialogue spontaneously unfolds just like it does off the, off the mat in real life. The only difference is that when I am on my mat, I am invited to bring greater awareness to what is happening inside of me. The mat is the symbol of that. Unrolling the mat and getting on it is a ritual way of saying, I give myself to the flow of my experience. I will be curious about it. I will follow it wherever it goes. That judgmental voice, it's like a crazed monkey with a baseball bat in a tiny room full of delicate and beautiful glass sculptures. The judgmental voice smashes one way, it smashes another way. Others are the target, yes, but you and I were the targets first. Let's step back to see the larger story. You and I were born into a social world that ruthlessly sorts us according to whichever identities are ours. And it does this based on a values agenda that is all its own. You and I are born and our tiny bodies bear a certain skin color and we're judged about that. We are born and our tiny bodies come with certain sex organs and we are judged about that. Born, we possess congenital disorders or we don't. And even more judgment comes our way, good or bad, better or worse, worthy or unworthy. It happens in so many ways. Consider birth order identity. I was born a second child who eventually became a middle child and such a birth order identity easily leads to becoming the forgotten child. You are not the eldest whose right to exist is unquestioned because they were there before you and they were lavished with a loving attention that was undivided. But now you come along upon the scene, you are desperate to divide that loving attention so you can get in on some of that for yourself. You want in on that love, but you must work to get it. It's called sibling rivalry. Same basic situation with the youngest child. You are not the youngest, thus you are not the more vulnerable one or the cutest. And therefore, you are not the one on whom love is easily lavished. Again, you got to work to get noticed. Our Unitarian Universalist first principle of inherent worth and dignity, inherent meaning, unconditional meaning, endless meaning, infinite, makes no sense at all to a middle child made no sense to me. We all have our stories of growing up. I offer mine just to get you thinking about yours. Besides racial and gender and ability and birth order identities, consider how we are born into certain groups. We are born into families that are rich or middle class or poor and we are judged accordingly. We are born into single-parent families or two-parent families. 
or some other kind of family, and we are judged. Families that are Christian or Muslim or Jewish or Unitarian Universalist, and we are judged. All these identities trigger social judgment as better or worse. Judgments conflict as well, depending on which part of society you happen to be talking about. And then we grow older. Interests and talents are revealed, and they become identities that trigger judgments of bad or good. So does sexual orientation, and society definitely gives a person feedback about that. We are temporarily abled until in some way we are not, and then we feel the sting of ableism. Our bodies grow into their adult shapes, and we are revealed as tall or short, as skinny or middling or fat, as ugly or beautiful. And every identity word I am using here just oozes, oozes with judgmentalism. Good or bad, better or worse, worthy or unworthy. Judgmentalism, I am saying, is a fundamental condition of human finitude. Judgmentalism fundamentally limits us. There is, in fact, so much emphasis on the judged identities that make us up that it can seem we are nothing but our identities, and therefore we are nothing but beings who are judged. Our entire being is encompassed by judgment. The whole social process is so ruthless and all-encompassing that very soon in our lives we internalize the judgmentalism, perhaps in a Stockholm Syndrome sort of way, the judgment coming at us from the outside world becomes a sub-personality within, a voice inside our very own heads that takes on independence and comes and goes as it pleases. Call it the judger. The judger judges everything. The judger is like that crazed monkey with a baseball bat in a tiny room full of delicate and beautiful glass sculptures, smashing every which way, good, bad, better, worse, worthy, unworthy. If we Unitarian Universalists happen to be white or to be middle or upper class, the judger at times gives voice to our unconscious racism and classism as it smashes away at the people we encounter in the outside world. Inevitably, this happens, and we can be so shocked. We thought we were nicer than that. But it just means that we are not sufficiently aware of the socialization process that takes a tiny human baby and gets it up to speed to play its part in the game of society, even at times against its will, in ways against its will. The game of society is to be judged and to judge, to endlessly reproduce that. I believe that human fragility and vulnerability to pain and death are behind all of it. This gives birth to fear and to greed, and these metastasize into hatred. They are fiery forces, and they are unleashed through judgmentalism. They surge within the judgmentalism we feel towards others, but, but first and foremost, such fiery forces have been unleashed upon each of us. We have felt the full blast of fear and greed and hatred ourselves. This is the insight to hold on to. Judging others, then, becomes like a release valve. Judging others momentarily takes the pressure off of ourselves. We are choking on the hate of a hater that was put inside of us which we did not knowingly choose. A moment just to breathe means so much. When you've been abused, it can feel like sweet relief to abuse others. One day, I found myself back in yoga class 
and back on my mat, which represents my commitment to being curious about my inner experience. I was moving from one pose to another, and soon enough, the crazed monkey with his baseball bat started to smash away, and just like a broken record, the judger's voice was again comparing my yoga poses to those of others, telling me that I was so much better. And then again came the shame for doing this, and all of a sudden I heard the judger's harsh voice in my head judging me. But this time, the judger got interrupted. A wave of compassion came upon me. A wave, a wave, a wave, a wave. In that moment, I saw how my judgmentalism of others only expressed how my own soul had been crushed if it was anything, it was simply evidence of bad things that had been done unto me. My judgmentalism of others, beyond the mat too, trained on any and all identities that the others I encountered may possess, was simply the cry of my soul that had only wanted to be loved unconditionally and to be treated as if he had inherent worth and dignity without regard to any specific identities, and this had not happened. From out of my judgment-filled human finitude, I have always longed to touch and be touched by the infinite, which is unconditional love. My mat to me, in that moment of compassion, truly became sacred space. Out of my judgment-filled human finitude, I discovered the inkling of an identity that has nothing to do with judgment and everything to do with love. And from that point on, moving forward, I knew that I could not fully and freely live any of my smaller identities that society sorts me into and judges me by unless I was in some simultaneous sense always also dwelling in love. If I can live within the larger infinite love that my Unitarian Universalism affirms when it speaks of my worth and dignity as inherent, if I can steadily see the world from that perspective, then I can bring compassion to every person I meet whose judgmentalism is but evidence of how deeply they themselves have been judged and how fear and greed and hatred have damaged them and damaged us all. That's the main thing, being able to bring compassion. Following all of these insights, sometimes later, I fell into a moment of quiet and a memory came to mind, a memory surfaced. The memory was of something I had read about Malcolm X, a deep moment of realization of his own in a context that on the surface seems entirely different, but it is not. Malcolm X, you may know, was and is a powerful prophetic black voice raised against the sort of judgmentalism known as racism. He was assassinated in 1965 when he was just 40. The story of his I have to tell happened just months before his tragic death. Malcolm X had been the key leader of the Nation of Islam, which, writes Pierre Tristam in Thought Company, was an odd cult whose principles of racial hatred and separatism and whose strange beliefs about whites being a genetically engineered race of devils, all of this stood in contrast with Islam's more orthodox teachings. Malcolm eventually became disillusioned with the nation's leader, Elijah Muhammad, and he realized that authentic Islam was a very different thing entirely than what he had been teaching. And so, he went on a pilgrimage to Mecca 
which is the destination of every pious Muslim at least once in life. From America, Malcolm first traveled to Cairo, the Egypt, Egyptian capital, then to Jeddah, the Saudi city. Muslims there already knew who he was. As Malcolm writes in his autobiography, they were aware of the yardstick that I was using to measure everything that to me, the Earth's most explosive and pernicious evil is racism, the inability of God's creatures to live as one, especially in the Western world. When Malcolm finally arrived in Mecca, his mind was blown. My vocabulary, he says, cannot describe the new mosque in Mecca that was being built around the Kaaba. It was, he says, a huge black house, black stone house in the middle of the grand mosque. It was being circumambulated by thousands upon thousands of praying pilgrims, both sexes and every size, shape, color, and race in the world. Malcolm continues, my feeling here in the house of God was numbness. My mutawif, my religious guide, led me in the crowd of praying, chanting pilgrims, moving seven times around the Kaaba. Some were bent and wizened with age. It was a sight that stamped itself on the brain. In my 39 years on this earth, says Malcolm, the holy city of Mecca had been the first time I had ever stood before the creator of all and felt like a complete human being. And that's from Malcolm's autobiography. In America, he did not feel like a complete human being. From the beginning of his days, as is true of all of us, society sorted him. But because he was black and he was a man. The sorting he endured was painful and disfiguring in a way that non-blacks can never understand truly. It is, I mean, is it so strange, let me ask you, West Shore, is it so strange for someone judged because of the color of their skin and nothing else to think that whites must be a genetically engineered race of devils as the nation of Islam taught? Is it so strange? But authentic Islam became a place for him to dwell within and to really see, to really witness how God's creatures might live as one as opposed to the creatures of society who cannot possibly live as one because judgmentalism divides them into good or bad, better or worse, worthy or unworthy. I stood upon my yoga mat to see this, and Malcolm stood before the Kaaba and saw it circumambulated by thousands upon thousands of praying pilgrims, both sexes, every size, shape, color, race in the world, and his feelings there in front of the house of God, he says, was numbness. It blew his finite mind. For the first time, right then, he felt like a complete human being. And that is really what I am talking about today. How to feel like complete human beings, whoever we are, whatever our particular collection of social identities happens to be. Soon, Martin would write a letter to a friend in New York. And the letter was published May 8th, 1964, by the New York Times. In this letter he says, there are Muslims of all colors and ranks here in Mecca from all parts of this earth. During the past seven days of this holy pilgrimage, I have eaten from the same plate, drank from the same glass, slept on the same bed or rug while praying to the same God not only with some of this earth's most powerful kings, cabinet members, potentates, and other forms of political and religious rulers, 
but also with fellow Muslims whose skin was the whitest of white, whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, yet it was the first time in my life that I didn't see them as white men. I could look into their faces and see that these didn't regard themselves as white. Their belief in the oneness of God had actually removed the white from their minds, which automatically affected their attitude and behavior towards people of other colors. Their belief in the oneness of God has actually made them so different from American whites, their outer physical characteristics played no part at all in my mind during all my close associations with them. That's Malcolm's letter, an excerpt of the full thing. And the part that really stands out for me is when he speaks about the white in other people's minds, being removed, being removed, whiteness, being the judgmentalism that automatically translates into seeing non-whites as bad, as worse, than as unworthy. We could equally speak of the male in people's minds, or the straight in people's minds, or the able in people's minds, or the middle class in people's minds, and on and on. Forms of judgmentalism that have been put in people's minds by a society following its own value agenda and wanting to maintain its ancient, ruthless game. Malcolm came away from his pilgrimage to Mecca affirming that belief in the oneness of God, which to him meant belief in Islam, was the power that could help every believing individual to dwell in infinite love, even as simultaneously they lived as finite human beings bearing finite identities of race and class and gender and all the others. Again, again, the need to balance, to balance an infinite identity with finite identities is a matter of antidoting the judgmentalism. It is a matter of taking away that baseball bat from that crazed monkey, judger within. The judger within starts up and he gets neutralized by the wave of compassion that comes pouring in. This is love witnessing the abuse behind all the judgmentalism. This is love empowering us to stop playing the judgmentalism game and to see all people as children of God. I am not a Muslim. I don't believe in the same sort of God that Malcolm believed in. But I do believe that we ended up in the same place. His pilgrimage experience to Mecca took him, I believe, to the same place that my revelation upon my yoga mat took me, that we do not have to experience others and ourselves as purely finite beings, completely bounded by judgmentalism, nothing but a collection of identities and relating to others through judgmentalism. It is true, of course, as long as we live in this world, all our finite identities will remain. No one can stop being white or black or cisgender or transgender or male or female or intersex and on and on, but that is, that is not all of who we are. We can also and at the same time live as children of God. We can see ourselves and others from that standpoint. And energy flows from that. Compassion that is divine flows from that. Compassion that disrupts the vicious judgmentalism game. I will close with a few specific insights about what it means to live from an identity of love which is infinite. The first is that right and wrong are not thereby vanquished. Right and wrong remain. Racism is wrong. Sexism is wrong. Abuse of any kind is wrong. Yes, abusiveness ultimately comes from being abused first. It comes from being a tiny baby, born a tiny baby, and you're growing up in a society that abuses it the baby grows up in a society that abuses it through ruthless judgmental as a way to prepare it to play the game of human life. 
The abused abuse, but abuse itself is wrong. It must be stopped, and abusers must be held accountable. Compassion, however, says that abusers must never be treated like monsters. Holding abusers accountable must involve firmness, but kindness. Holding abusers accountable must not trap them even further in their judged finite identities. And if we are the ones in the line of an abuser's fire, well, self-love says stop returning into the line of fire. Stop putting yourself into a place of unsafety. Get someplace self because, because you love yourself. And now a second insight about living from an infinite identity of love, which is related to the first. It's about affirming the universalist idea that people's actions are always motivated by the aim of doing what is good and right. But as people happen to conceive of what good and right are, people can be terribly confused about it. And so they may act in ways that go very contrary to their best interests and those of others. So, of people who are confused, the question becomes, what got you there? What experiences have led you to think that? Say you're having a Facebook conversation with someone about politics, right? The best thing ever. They say something that, to your mind, is egregious. Don't flame them. Don't write them off as a monster. They're a child of God. And you are living from your child of God identity if you say back to them, huh, that has not been my experience. Tell me your experience. Pay attention. Get on your yoga mat and get more curious. A third and final insight. When we are living from a child of God identity, which is love, which is infinite. We see ourselves and we see others as true mysteries. Each of us is fighting a hard battle, the extent of which is truly unknown. You may think you know others or yourself, and therefore you may think that the judger voice within you speaks truly, but that judger voice is finite. It is fashioned out of the fires of fear and greed and hate. It is fashioned out of the need of society to reproduce its values game, its judgmentalism game. It will never honor the love in you and the full extent of who you are. It will never honor the love that is others and the full extent of who they are. It cannot. This is why I commend the phrase child of God even to those of us who don't believe in God because everyone's challenge, atheist or not, is unconsciously falling into the trap of thinking that we ourselves are godlike, infallible in our opinions. But our opinions are not godlike, infallible because we are not God. We actually don't know squat about others or ourselves. To call yourself a child of God is to acknowledge this finitude of understanding. But it is also, and at the same time, to affirm that you belong to the infinite. You belong to love. That there are depths in you that you may never know. That there is a goodness and a wisdom in you that right now you might not be feeling, but just because you're not feeling it right now doesn't mean it's not there. Maybe you would feel it if you got on a yoga mat. Maybe you would feel it if you took a pilgrimage to Mecca as Malcolm did and saw what he saw. Maybe there is a way to compassion for you that is not about a yoga mat, not about Mecca, 
but it's something else that is especially yours. Find it. Do not allow yourself to be nothing but a pawn in society's game. Free your mind. Do not allow yourself to be bound completely by judgmentalism and all the small identities arising out of judgmentalism. All your limited identities are you, yes, but you are also more than that. Always. You belong to love. You are love. You are a child of God. You are. You are. Amen. I am what I am, and I am my own special creation. Look, and give me the hook or the ovation. It's my world that I want to have a little pride in. My world, and it's not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say, hey world, I am what I I don't want pity I bang my own drum Some think it's noise I think it's pretty It's my song And if you don't like the style I bring it My song So at least respect my right to sing it Your life is a sham Till you can shout out loud I am what I Excuses. I deal my own deck, sometimes the ace, sometimes the deuces. It's high time that I blow my horn and sound my trumpet. High time, and if you don't like it, you can lump it. Life's not worth a damn till you can say, hey world, I am one. Now bring your chalice close to extinguish it as I extinguish the chalice here. We, exchange, we extinguish our flames, we say, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we meet again. Remember, no coffee hour today, instead a world cafe at 11.30, followed by the sermon chat at 12.30, and then a second world cafe will take place this afternoon at 3.30. And now the benediction, which is a poem by Annie Lightheart, entitled, The Second Music. Now I understand that there are two melodies playing one below the other, one easier to hear, the other lower, steady, perhaps more faithful for being less heard, yet always present. When all other things seem lively and real, this one fades, yet the notes of it touch as gently as fingertips, as the sound of the names laid over each child at birth. I want to stay in that music without striving or cover. If the truth of our lives is what it is playing, the telling is so soft that this 
mortal time, this irrevocable change becomes beautiful. I stop and stop again to hear the second music. I hear the children in the yard, a train, then birds. All this is in it and will be gone. I set my ear to it as I would to a heart. That is the poem, West Shore. This week and always, may you set your ear to love as you would to a heart. May you live from the second music of your infinite identity in love as a child of God. So may it be. Amen. See you next week, West Shore. Love, courage, cheer to you.